and we have to really escalate the noise we make so that we'll be heard. Welcome to Gay USA. I'm Andy Hum. I'm Ann Northrup. And in the news this week, of course, you may have heard that President Trump is reported to have joked that uh, Vice President Pence wants us executed. If only it were a joke. Unfortunately, there's too much of a ring of truth to it. But meanwhile, uh, really going after us, the Attorney General, we've talked about him a lot, but this week he says he actually will enforce the law in our favor, and that rates him a headline. We told you about the uh, bullied uh, gay Bronx teen, Abel Cedeno, who was accused of killing his tormentor in class. Well, he got his charges reduced this week to manslaughter from murder two. Andy has been uh, Johnny on the spot on this case and will give you all the details, uh, including his interview with Abel Cedeno. And uh, we note with awe the press conference held by a gay Chechen man who came out publicly about the way he was kidnapped and tortured by his government. Uh, doctors are going to be required to ask adult patients about their sexual orientation. In, In Britain. Br I'm gonna... <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I stepped on your line. It's I was okay. afraid you were uh, going doc to fail to report that. Many doctors here do it uh, and should. Uh, and more should. Uh, we will review, give, a, your, give you our opinions of beats per minute, the Paris Act Up AIDS film that was such a big hit at the Cannes Film Festival. Uh, and I will bring you up to date on the lesbian storyline on The Young and the Restless. So we start with uh, a, a big profile of Vice President Pence in uh, The New Yorker by yes. Jane Mayer. Yes. Now, Jane Mayer is the one who really uh, brought to our attention just how evil the Koch brothers are, the depths of their Wonderful evil. Wonderful reporter. The Koch brothers are the ones who run the country, if you hadn't uh, noticed. They really do. I mean, yes. they run your state legislatures, they run the, the Congress. <sighs> and, and anything they don't run, they're and, trying to take over in the next midterms. And Mike Pence, by the way, I think this is the connection here, Mike Pence is the candidate that the Koch brothers wanted to win the presidency. Uh, but then he, and he was going to run, but then he didn't run because he made such a hash of his job as governor of Indiana that he couldn't even get reelected as governor of Indiana because of the way he handled the gay thing so ineptly. Uh, and but he was really, his nomination as vice president was the price that Trump paid for the support of the evangelical community. Yes. And, and screwing the rest of us forever because the idea that Pence is the man in waiting is uh, uh, terrifying territory. And, you know, one of the, th Trump apparently makes uh, fun of Pence quite a bit in the White House. Uh, you know, like, uh, you know, he thinks he's gonna get rid of abortion, but it's just gonna go to the states. They're gonna, they're gonna allow it, you know. I mean, Trump doesn't know what he's talking about, but these are the kinds of jokes, jokes that he makes. Oh, and he says, uh, he says to other people, did he make you pray? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, as if he takes prayer seriously. Yeah. Uh, but what, what, what also was reported that uh, he, he was, the, the topic was on gay rights and Trump gestured to Pence and says, uh, don't ask that guy, he wants to hang them all. Well, this is actually uh, part of the Christian Bible, uh, or excuse me, the, well, the, the Bible. Uh, Leviticus does call for the execution of gay people. It's an abomination. They should be put to death. I am, and uh, Pence is a, a very strong evangelical Christian. He used to be a Catholic, by the way. He converted. Um, There's a lot of that going on. Anyway, so, that, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, one more example of something that's horrifying. Well, and uh, it's not all that far off from what Pence does think and from what his uh, base of religious evangelicals think. And we have discussed many times on this show how uh, Pence and Atten Attorney General Sessions and others want to impose a biblical uh, 
hegemony in this country that would overrule civil law. I think Ben Carson's in favor of that too. Uh, so well, if the uh, yeah, Trump uh, Trump is our <laughs> our semi bulwark against that, but then he goes to the Values Voters Summit and gives a speech that includes all his stuff about protecting religious liberty, which of course was. Uh, Sessions uh, issuance of guidelines last week. Well, he, he did say that uh, at the at the um, uh, forum uh, we are returning moral clarity to our view of the world. <laughs> this was his quote. Times are changing, but times are changing back now. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the other speakers was Duck Dynasty's Phil Robertson, who was oh, he's the least of it. For this is a Tony Perkins production, and this was every right-wing evangelical. Not the slasher in Psycho. <laughs> Tony Perkins, the crazy evangelical family research and council Steve guy, and Steve Bannon, and all the heavy hitters on the far right wing. Uh, so it's very scary stuff and you really need to keep your eye on it. I watched some of uh, Trump's speech to the Heritage Foundation. That yes. was very tightly scripted around tax cuts. But again, he is praising them as the important foundational organization. And they, again, uh, you know, founded by Paul Weyrich, uh, very, very right wing, very, very homophobic, uh, high on their agenda is getting rid of us. And of course, there are a lot of left wing reporters and progressive activists who go to these conventions and just sit quietly and listen to what's being said and report back to the world and to us about what's going on. And one of them talked about how he went to one workshop where they talked about very openly, these right wingers, about their strategy being to separate the LGB from the T, that uh, this divide and conquer business and all the stuff they're doing on transgender stuff is meant to separate us out and to create division and warfare. Well, there is some division. I mean, you, you get, you get, you read the comment sections on some of these gay blogs and people say, oh, you know, these goddamn transgender people, you know, I mean, if we, you know, they, the, the, you know, we'd be fine if we didn't have to deal with this issue. Well, guys, and mostly it's guys, uh, you know, but we are the, we gay men are persecuted because we step outside of gender roles. I mean, I'm going to talk about the Abel Cedeno case, and there were rallies up there, and almost all the people up there demonstrating for Abel, who now identifies as a gay male, is uh, uh, were transgender activists. You know, they're there for us. Uh, the the reason the right wing succeeds is because we are suckers for the divide and conquer strategy, whether it is about race or gender or class or. Uh, sexual orientation or gender identity, we fall for that stuff well, we uh, as what, human beings. Well, we remember what happened when they when they finally were going to vote on our federal civil rights bill and Barney Frank and the human rights campaign took transgender out of it and said, you know, isn't it better to get something? And we said no. Um, hundreds of groups across the country said no, but they went ahead with that anyway. Yeah. And then now they say they'll never do it again. <laughs> Well, and I remember in uh, New York State when we were fighting for uh, sexual orientation to be included in the hate crimes bill, and they wanted to leave us out, and the Black and Latino Caucus in Albany in the state legislature said, you are not passing a hate crimes bill unless you include sexual orientation. That was just leaving sexual orientation in. Yeah. But then when we passed a Sexual Orientation Non-Discrimination Act, and it's as late as, I believe, 2002, uh, I had to say, you know, the, p p say, don't do this without cl including gender identity. And I remember um, the, the head of the Empire State Pride agenda saying, you would go ahead and just not do it without. I said, not a, we'll never get. We're not going to get it, and we and we haven't gotten it. It's right. this all these years later. Right. We had to have the governor do an executive order on it, but that's not permanent, as we've learned with President Trump. To include gender identity yes. as a protected class. Well, of course we've. But my point being that other people have stood up for us. Yes. And and we have certainly on occasion stood up for everybody, but we need to do that a lot more. We must have alliances and uh, inclusion of everybody to be able to overcome. 
this right wing uh, tsunami. Intersectionality. I mean, the early LGBT activists came out of the peace movement, the women's movement, and the civil rights movement. So they already had that sense. And those issues. That was were all evident in ACT UP, by the way. There were, all those people were in the room, and that was one reason it worked as well as it did because everybody brought their experiences, their values, uh, their strategies into that room. And we used to work on a lot of those other issues a lot of the time because we weren't getting anywhere on LGBT rights in the early days. I mean, we were working on it and there was a tremendous amount of work to do, but in terms of getting legislative achievements in the early days, it was very hard. And we still don't have a federal LGBT rights bill. All right. Well, we skipped the uh, the greatest uh, hope for white supremacist Christianity of all, and that's Roy Moore. And he was at the Values Voters Summit. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pre President Trump was confronted about the Moore's completely radical positions, which are, which are basically that if it's a choice between the Constitution and the Bible, the Bible wins. Right. They say these things openly. Absolutely. So they press. They pre this is what's coming to the United States Senate. They pressed Trump on it, and he said, I'll be meeting with him next week. He dodged it. But headline uh, a new Fox News poll we don't usually quote them has uh, him tied with Doug Jones 42 to 42 now is that good or bad well it's it's uh, amazing I would say I mean you know amazing of, that we're doing that well yes, or that, that we're doing, we're doing that, doing that well. poorly Are you, you know well yeah, okay. look I mean in Alabama where where 81 percent of people voted against same-sex marriage well, I repeat, as I have said before, that Roy Moore lost two gubernatorial, yes. gubernatorial primaries. He is not entirely bulletproof uh, in the political sense, uh, but it is certainly going to be difficult to defeat yes, him. Yes, I've heard Doug Jones speak. He's unapologetic. He's he's smooth. He's a you know former federal prosecutor. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you know it's so uh, people. Uh, even see the thing is even if someone like him gets close in a race like that it sends a message to the to the, the, the Republican Party all across the nation that you keep nominating these crazies uh, you may not lose Alabama but you're gonna lose the close ones for sure I mean everybody complains that you know all the tr the Trump cabinet appointees who were from Congress uh, we didn't win those seats uh, in the on the Democratic side and it's not an accident uh, b but we came, we, we closed the gap in every one of those districts by well, double digits. And we have been winning some special elections this year. In and state legislatures yes, and things like that. Yes, yes. so uh, I'm not unoptimistic about next year, although I, uh, even though Trump is just uh, destroying himself on a daily basis, yes. I remain convinced that there's a large chance he will be with us for a long time. If only we had a party better than the Democratic Party. <sighs> But that's what we have. Okay. All right. Let's move on to actual news. Well, uh, so 15 attorneys general in the United States are opposing Trump's ban on transgender troops, and, and they were led by Maura Healy up in Massachusetts. Who is the out lesbian attorney general of Massachusetts. And we know that uh, a bipartisan uh, little uh, coalition has introduced legislation in the Senate, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, Susan Collins, others, to get rid of Trump's bar on transgender troops. Well, now identical legislation or similar has been introduced in the House, again by a coalition, Republican Charlie Dent, Democrat Kirsten Sinema. Uh, they are introducing legislation that would uh, forbid discharge of transgender troops and allow everybody to have a chance to serve if they are qualified. Now I'm turning 64. I have less than a year to go to Medicare. I don't know if it's going to be there when I, uh, next October when Happy I need birthday, it. Happy birthday, Andy! Thank you very much. His but, birthday is the 19th. But thank you. But what I'm worried about is I'm I'm on the ACA, and we're all terrified of November 1st when these rates come down. There's been a lot of news about this week. First, the president was really undermining it with these uh, setting up these uh, multiple employer uh, welfare arrangements, which allow people to give cut rate plans that don't cover anything. I thought and that might help you. You could get a cut rate yeah, plan for yeah, a year. Yeah, I could get a cut rate plan that doesn't cover anything. <laughs> uh, and and I, believe me, I thought about it. Yeah. Uh, but I think they're only going to make it available to young people and take them out of the market and all that kind of stuff. But so then the uh, senators, uh, uh, Lamar Alexander and Patty Murray, bipartisan, come up with a, something to sort of save the a 
ACA, the Affordable Care Act, uh, but change some things and that kind of stuff. We're go the results are coming out on Thursday. Uh, we're taping on Wednesday. Uh, so w what's your sense of this at this point? Uh, I'm sure it will be, uh, you know, uh, the standard line is that Obamacare, ACA, needs fixes. It does. So the idea is to do some of those fixes in this legislation uh, to, in fact, uh, mollify those who scream that the ACA is not a good thing. So I'd love to think that that would be a step in that direction. Uh, Trump first supported it, then he was against it. Who uh, we'll see. Well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't no, know what's he in. Does. He doesn't know what's in any of this legislation, no. and most of it, of course, his actions are just based on wanting to erase Obama's legacy. Because well, yes. he doesn't like black people. And <laughs> as you saw with the that's uh, Kanye West's line soldier. about George Bush. Um, but the real question for him, because he doesn't know anything and doesn't follow anything and can't read anything, is who will have his ear? What will his minders, whoever they are, tell him to do? If Tony Perkins is telling him to oppose this uh, and the right wing, the far right wing is telling him, you know, you cannot possibly support this or sign it, uh, then he's going to be against it. Right. And, you know, it's encouraging to see Patty Murray working with Lamar Alexander or vice versa. Uh, and it's encouraging to see the speech that John McCain gave this week condemning the foreign policy of, uh, uh, um, of uh, President Trump. I have uh, complaints against both of them, but I will take the positive moments but, from them. But, and you, have a, you had a Republican congressman, I believe it was, this week saying what we really need is a Democratic Congress to be a check against yes. Trump. Yes. Uh, that's how bad things are. Well, David Jolly, former yes. uh, congressman from Florida, Republican, said that. Right. And uh, he's right, of course. And if more Republicans say that, then maybe we can make some headway but next year. The problem is, and I've said it before on the show, and I'll say it again, because what we're, where we're really getting killed is with the judiciary. They have 150 judiciary posts to fill. Uh, Democrats are slowing them down somewhat using this uh, blue slip thing, uh, where, where this, if you're the senator from that state, you can do it, but they're gonna stack them up. And no, I haven't seen any Republicans stand up to any of these appointments, and these are extremists. I mean, you know, we, I mean, maybe we've overused the word, but when you read about, you know, one of this guy Jeff Mateer, you know, talking about transgenders as part of Satan's plan, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, so, you know, where federal are judge. Where going are going to be a federal where judge? Where are John McCain, Susan Collins, Bob Corker, Lisa Murkowski, Jeff Flake, Dean Heller, Lamar Alexander, who, you know, at least. Uh, sounds semi-reasonable on some things. Uh, where are they on this? They're going to leave the country in tatters. Uh, they, uh, it's a very strange situation because they are not committed to the resistance. They are willing to stick their hand up episodically, but they have no fundamental commitment to resisting Trump. McCain is actually coming the closest now because he has nothing more to lose. He, and Bob Corker is leaving. Yes. Uh, and didn't take back a word he said about Trump and the fact that he needs adult daycare. Yes. I appreciate that. But fundamentally, they are Republicans. And yes. they that is what they're committed to. So uh, we're still in very dangerous territory. Right. Uh, and... You know, the one uh, supposed bright light this week was that the attorney general uh, sent his staff to go help prosecute the murder of a young transgender woman in Iowa. Ketta Reed Johnson, 16, who was shot to death in March 2016. Right. Uh, 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 so this is him fulfilling his promise to pursue hate crimes. Well, he's trying to sh he's trying to show uh, by his standards you wrote gender identity into this law, into this hate crimes law. And I'm I am applying the law. With the other laws, it says it says sex discrimination. It does not say gender identity. And our interpretation is that's not covered under the law, even though there are many court decisions that say so. The problem is that the whole policy and spirit of the Trump administration and the Department of Justice in particular is to discriminate against transgender people and by withdrawing the Obama guidelines for schools, by not including transgender people in non-discrimination laws, by 
uh, throwing transgender people out of the military and by cozying up to these bigots who condemn transgender people as creations of Satan and putting the, them on the uh, federal courts or uh, you know, letting them run policy in the White House. And the result is that transgender people get murdered. Right. So for Sessions to suddenly decide that he's going to participate in the prosecution of a murderer of a transgender teenager is a hypocrisy of the highest level and really depressing to think about. Right. All right. Uh, and um, speaking of intersectionality, it was nice to see that uh, Robbie Kaplan's law firm, now Robbie Kaplan argued this successful uh, marriage case at the uh, uh, Supreme Court. Um, she was Edie Windsor's lawyer. Um, she is using a reconstruction, excuse me, reconstruction <laughs> era law uh, to uh, sue the Ku Klux Klan, Vanguard America, National Front, League of the South for all their Charlottesville activities. Um, using, uh, you know, she's got this big complaint against them and she's uh, going up against them. Congratulations to her and her partner for setting up this new law firm. She was at Paul Weiss for many years and did her work for Edie Windsor and the Mississippi uh, case out of Paul Weiss, but she is now independent and we look forward to a lot of uh, work like and this. And I should her. say that the suit itself is being brought by the nonprofit Integrity First for America. All group. right, let's move on to the horrifying uh, story we heard today as we did our research for the show. And that comes out of California, and young Gabriel Fernandez, eight years old, tortured to death by his mom's boyfriend and by his mother to some extent. Now, the story from the boyfriend we have is... We a picture of, uh, the, of the little kid. Yes, uh, uh, eight years old, Gabriel. The boyfriend is claiming that uh, uh, part of this is because he thought Gabriel was gay, and he used to send, force him to go to school in dresses. That was the twisted thing he did. Who was this, Joe Arpaio? Yeah, and he also was angry, mostly he was angry at Gabriel because Gabriel told his mother to leave this boyfriend. And, uh, and that sent him into a rage. That's his explanation, he snapped. Well, the rage evidently lasted for quite a long time because this is what he did to Gabriel. He beat him, he bit him, he burned him with cigarettes, he whipped him, he shot him with a BB gun, he starved him, he fed him cat litter, and he gagged and bound him in a small cubby space. I have him also forcing him to eat his own feces and vomit putting cigarettes out on his skin, dousing him in pepper spray. I mean, this, this, goes, this was just torture, 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 torture for an eight-year-old little boy. Eight-year-old. So uh, the boyfriend and mother are now being prosecuted. We will certainly uh, follow this case, but wow, that you know, was a that was Well, a the tradition of just, you know, beating the gay out of a kid yeah. has been going on for a long time, and this is just the most extreme example that we've ever read. Yeah. Now, the other case that we're following quite closely, and Andy really is the main reporter on this here in the city, uh, Abel Cedeno in the Bronx, we've talked to you about him. He's uh, 18 years old. He was being bullied mercilessly and repeatedly at school. Well, he was being, uh, he's 18 years old. He was being bullied mercilessly since the sixth grade. Apparently in the fifth grade, uh, his sister told me he decided to grow his hair long so he could donate it to cancer patients. And so he had long hair. So he got, in the sixth grade, he starts getting teased from that. They start pulling his hair, all this kind of stuff. But he, you know, he goes through school. He, he misses a lot of school because he's getting bullied all the time. His mother keeps going to the schools and saying, what are you gonna do about this? Oh, um, Abel, the teachers would say, if they call you a faggot, you need to be the better person. You need to suck it up and you be the better. I mean, this is what they're telling them instead of, you know, disciplining the bullies or trying to do some kind of uh, conciliation kind of a thing where you kind of end this atmosphere. So this went on forever. So at the, in the end, he's repeating the 12th grade. A lot of he had he had uh, uh, girlfriends and, and but they had left and they were kind of his protectors because they graduated and he's left behind. And so new school year, uh, he's in a class. And these two guys, well, we've told the story before, but we've learned more details. 
and he told them all to me from Rikers Island. So uh, he, the jail where he's being held. What you keep reading is he didn't know these kids who he, uh, who, he, who who uh, involved in the confrontation. He did know them. He knew them as gang members who might be carrying knives or guns who had already beaten up his best friend. Mm -hmm. So he knew them and he was afraid of them. Mm -hmm. He didn't have personal encounters with them, but this was, so they're the ones who were throwing stuff. They were throwing pencils and pens and things. And he, you know, he just finally said, who was doing this to me? Who was, you know, you know and, and so the kid gets up and says, I'm doing it. What are you gonna do about it? Basically, I'm, they use slang. And uh, so then he said he felt frozen because this, even though the kid was younger than him, he was bigger than him, and uh, and he was afraid of him. And the the kid who's now deceased starts punching him in the face. Came came fifty feet up the classroom to confront him. Didn't you know? Made a very aggressive move. And then and but. Seeing that he's holding to his side this knife that he's obtained, and they keep calling it a Able. switch. Yeah. Abel is holding uh, holding a knife by his side. In fact, one of the the, the deceased friends, said, uh, a guy named Frankie, says, "Oh, don't don't go after him, Matthew. He look, he's got a he's got a." And, but Matthew doesn't care. This is a faggot. Faggot's not going to fight. And he starts punching him. Even when Matthew gets stabbed, he's still punching him. This is what Abel told the grand jury uh, this week and got his charges reduced from murder two to manslaughter. Although I hear the DA is still going to try to go after him for attempted murder for s slashing the other kid who went after him, who was uh, Matthew's friend. So look, a tragedy all around. Look, if we, if we had gotten, been able to talk to this kid before, we would have said, get out of the school, go to the Harvey Milk School, or go someplace else. I talked to kids at the demonstration. There were a lot of people at the demonstration there. You got a there. picture of the demonstration. A lot of transgender activists showed up. Uh, some of them said, look, I got out. I, I, you know, I was homeschooled, or I just dropped out, or I hit the streets. This is what they did. One of the signs there says suicide or self-defense, because that's, what, that's the option for a lot of these kids. You know, that you're basically being told to go kill yourself because you're gonna to be tortured so relentlessly. And the teachers did nothing. So the interesting thing about all this is that the lawyers for the mother and the lawyers for him are both- The mother of the kid who was yeah, killed. The mother of the kid who was killed, Matthew McCree, are both condemning the school system and saying the, the, the Dignity for All Students Act, the anti-bullying law was not being enforced. Well, that's how they're going to make a kill um, a lot of money off the school system by saying you didn't enforce the law, your laws, your teachers didn't do anything, you didn't have a metal detector either. But we don't really want metal detectors in schools. We want good environments created for these kids. Well, and we want the environment created from the very beginning. This is senior year in high school. This should start at first grade or kindergarten. Right. This should be a, a core part of the curriculum from the very, very beginning. And we have a friend, Frank Jump, who teaches in the New York City public schools, and he taught at a school like that, where they did it up to the sixth grade, to the point where the kids didn't even want to leave the school because this was such a happy place, and they didn't want to go into the middle school where they were going to get tortured. And the problem is you got a million point one, one point one million students in the schools, and by the time you know things change, and uh, you know this school was uh, hurt by a lot of turnover in staff. It had been an okay place, and it changed. Uh, it's it's a it's a very hard thing to do, and the teachers are afraid of the kids, and you have a lot of gang activity in these schools, so they're really afraid of them. I mean, Abel's family is saying they have to move because they're afraid of retaliation from these gangs. Yes. And now, it's going to be very dicey to get people to testify. I did talk to the deceased's family, uh, Matthew's family. They said uh, Matthew was never involved in any of this kind of stuff. He was never involved in any violence. He was a great kid. He went to school all the time. He respected his elders. I'm j just saying that's what they say. Uh, and I hear that, uh, but it's and what I... Let me finish I... off. But also, in the courtroom, some of them from the family side were looking over at the transgender folks and saying, you he, she, I'm going to beat the crap out of you when I get out of here. So that's what happened. And when Andy told me this thing about uh, the family saying, you know, he was always a great guy and respectful of his parents, it just echoed me with every 
murderer we hear about whose family says, I never saw that coming. I, you know, he was a great person. Well, I, this story has resonated with a lot of uh, LGBT people. Mm -hmm. And th they feel, f they, f they showed up. Some of them didn't know him. They did not even connect it to any LGBT groups. They read about the story. They wanted to come to the courthouse and, and be in support of him. Uh, again, we wish it had not ended this way. We, I mean, I talked to him. I said, didn't, I said, Abel, didn't you know that there's a Harvey Milk school? Wait a minute. That there's a, that there are services. Wait a minute. We all we're all online. You know we can look look up look things up. There are services for LGBT youth, including in the Bronx. There are there are out. You know, they, but no, they didn't know any anything. His sister didn't know anything about it, and she's quite educated. She's she's a graduate of nursing school. Doesn't so, surprise me. Well, I mean, so my one of my solutions is every kid needs to get a piece of paper in their hands that says, if anything like this happens to you in terms of bullying, here are your options and we will follow through on this and make this happen for you. And there are places you can go. And if you are, every kid needs to get a piece of paper that says, if you are LGBT or questioning, there is a place for you to go. Every kid needs to get that. We used to uh, go to schools in the Bronx and everywhere else to do education and to take posters that could be hung up in uh, classrooms that told people where to go to get help. But those don't exist anymore. The education we did doesn't exist. It was episodic at best then. And people don't know because there is no commitment in the system to teach our history, teach resources, teach uh, people getting along with each other, teach values. None of that is there. And uh, I think it's more important than math and science and English. Uh, because if you don't have this respect uh, atmosphere, you can't learn. Exactly. You're just terrified. Or you won't go to school. I mean, Abel fought, as, and you Abel fought a lot. I don't want to go to school. I don't yeah. want to go to school. He was so depressed. Yeah. He was getting beat up. Yeah. Uh, this this was nothing new for him. So look, it's uh, we'll follow the case. We'll let you know what happens with it. Uh, a lot of people are trying to get him out on bail, though they've set the bail at half a million dollars. And uh, in the same category of uh, violence, uh, we this week got a verdict in the case of the Chelsea bomber, the guy who <laughs> yes, who, who tried to kill us. Yeah. Uh, I was out that night. I was out of the city, luckily. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is the guy who set off a bomb on West 23rd Street in Chelsea our a year street. ago. Not our where block. Where we both live. Not our block, but, but about our street. About half a mile away yeah. down the block. Right. And uh, had the other bomb that didn't explode and exploded other bombs elsewhere. And he was found guilty because they had him on videotape going all around the neighborhood putting the bombs down, and then watching them explode. This was a guy from Jersey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the Catholic Church uh, engaged in another attack on us this week. There was something called the uh, International Human Rights Arts Festival for the second year in a row. It featured Kathleen Turner. It was supposed to take place. They had rented a Catholic church called St. Mary's in Manhattan somewhere. And the Archdiocese said, well, two of these skits uh, have to do with homosexuality. I mean, one was about coming out, one was about transgender. If you'll take them out, you can still have it at our Catholic Church. <laughs> and they said, are you kidding? I mean, it's so Well, are petty you kidding? Why did they read, think they were going to get away with this in a Catholic Church well, to begin with? The, here's the question. What can you get away with and what, you, what can't you? There are a couple of Catholic parishes that basically have gay clubs and, and things that, uh, that the Archdiocese hasn't stopped. You know, as long as you don't challenge church teaching, you know. As long as you don't let it be publicly known. Well, they, but they are publicly known. As long as you're closeted. An Episcopal church in Brooklyn stepped in and took the festival, so they had it on Sunday night. All right, latest Harvey Weinstein update. Well, there are several things going on here. First of all, one of the people who has spoken up is the actress and model Cara Delevingne. Uh, she said that Harvey Weinstein said to her, because uh, she is publicly out, I guess, she said if, uh, he said to her, if you are out as a lesbian, you will never have a career. <laughs> Uh, and then he tried to get her to kiss another woman and have a three-way with him. He's trying, he's trying to help her out, <laughs> trying to straighten her out, you know? God. And you have a Nathan Lane story. Well, uh, uh, let's uh, first put up 
Yes, uh, let, let's put up Nathan's picture there with this. Nathan Harvey was hosting a fundraiser for Hillary in 2000, I think a birthday party, and Nathan told a joke at the event that Harvey didn't like. So Harvey comes backstage and throws him up against the wall. And so this is not sexual harassment, this is just a beating. Well, and, and Nathan says, you can't hurt me. I don't have a movie career. <laughs> That, Nathan well, is pretty quick. Uh, it, it's, it isn't just about uh, uh, sexual violence, which is what we're talking about. It's also about bullying and beating, and he's just uh, uh, a monster. And we've had, uh, you know, the Me Too hashtag all week, and uh, uh, millions, I think, of women have been coming. Almost everyone I know has posted about this, about it's at some time being sexually harassed by a boss, by a person with power over them. And some men. Me as, too. And some men, uh, you know, and including actor James uh, Vanderbeek, who just said when he was a young actor, you know, uh, he was uh, so, some guy grabbed his, some director grabbed his crotch, and uh, also actor Michael Gaston uh, spoke out, saying he was grabbed by in the groin by a powerful theater director. I mean, it, it you know, and there's a lot of that in the theater world. Epidemic. Absolutely endemic. epidemic, endemic. And the other interesting thing, and, and we talk... Uh, an occasional woman on a man, but it's very, very occasional. Yes, and, and uh, occasionally, who was it who talked about uh, having to be in a, a virtually naked lineup with a female producer, demanding that probably at the This has all got to stop. Oh, God. Please, uh, be oh. professional and be human. And, and don't be illegal. And there's also the story that we have heard about before and talked about where Harvey Weinstein was manipulating a financial transaction through Amfar. He had oh, been yes. a longtime supporter of Amfar. And he owed money to some other organization, a, a contribution he promised to make. And so he wanted, uh, he was offering auction items to Amfar, and then he wanted them to split the money with this other organization. And uh, Kevin Cole, who's... Uh, Kenneth George, Cole. Kenneth Cole, sorry, thank right. you. Uh, the shoe uh, uh, purveyor. Uh, was going along with us and supporting Harvey and doing this. And I'm happy to say that the Amfar uh, staff, uh, Kevin Frost, executive director, and others, were horrified at this and kept uh, objecting to it and trying to stop it. And in the end, Kenneth Cole just overruled everybody and made it happen. But uh, the whole story is now on the Huffington Post in a very long, detailed report, uh, which is fascinating. Uh, and well worth reading and is again about Harvey Weinstein being a bully and a narcissist who just demands that everything go uh, be for him. Still not as bad as the narcissist in chief who, who has a foundation and collects charitable contributions and uses them all for himself. Someone told me, oh my, uh, uh, who was it? My dentist told me yesterday that uh, he's losing a lot of money at his Scottish golf courses. Oh, yeah? Tens of millions. Oh, good. <laughs> well, he, apparently he's way down on the Forbes list of uh, rich people, yes. uh, too. Maybe that's all part of it. Uh, it can end anyway, badly enough, I, but I, I just I don't highly, want it to end badly for us. I highly recommend the Amfar Harvey Weinstein story in the Huffington Post. On can, we, the Huffington Post. can we give them some good news? Sure. Callan Lord, the uh, LGBT health agency here in New York, is sending emergency re uh, medical response to teams to Puerto Rico. It's the first community health center to do so. Some hospitals are involved. Very uh, they were happy chosen to read New about York. that. And California Governor Jerry Brown uh, signed a law making it easier to change gender markers on state-issued identification documents and created, it also creates a gender-neutral non-binary ca category in addition to male and female. And this is for inmates, this is for licenses, all kinds of things. Also signed a bill mandating data collection on LGBT people in state employment surveys and education surveys. We all want to be like California, but we're not. Yeah, they, you know. and a, a good story about a transgender teen from Maine. He uh, he had problems at his school in New Hampshire. Uh, let's see. Styles Zuxlag. 
There yes. he is. 17 years old, kicked out of a Christian academy in New Hampshire. Surprise. So he transfers to, his family moves, he transfers to Noble High School in North Berwick or Berwick, Maine, and he's elected homecoming king. All right. <laughs> Congratulations, Styles. We almost had a transgender winner on Jeopardy this week. Uh, the Knoxville School Board has voted to continue protecting LGBTQ students and employees, even and, though there was some tumult about that. And counties in Maryland and Michigan have voted to protect transgender students. Frederick County and Glass Lake, Michigan. Georgia and, is considering some work on that. And New York State now uh, has, as of today, uh, the first openly gay member of our state's highest court, of the Court of Appeals. Paul Feynman, congratulations to you. We've known Paul forever. And uh, we told you last week about how we had the ceremony to plant a uh, raise this uh, rainbow flag on federal property at the Stonewall Monument, and then the uh, federal government yanked the ground out from under us at the last minute by saying the flagpole is on city land. So, so they my, gave the flag to the city. Yeah, so it's up there on the flagpole, but they're calling it city land. So Michael Petrellis and other activists went back there this week to plant a rainbow flag on the federal land. <laughs> <laughs> and We were waving them at the ceremony on federal land. Yeah, well, they actually took some zip ties and uh, connected it to the fence they at the park. chained themselves to the fence. Mm -hmm. um, in Georgia... Uh, State Representative Renita Shannon has come out as bisexual in honor of National Coming Out Day. And here's what she said. She said, I'm a member of the LGBTQ community. I'm a bisexual black woman. Uh, she said, and under the Trump administration, proactive visibility seems more important than ever. It, is, it certainly does. Absolutely. In Vermont. Which is the good side effect of all this. In Vermont, they held a ceremony to uh, place an equality for same sex couples historic site marker at the Capitol in Montpelier uh, to mark the fact that uh, Vermont, uh, through a court ruling and a vote by the legislature, was the first place to legalize same sex partnerships with civil unions. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that was in 2000. And if you don't think things are changing, uh, in Arizona, four LGBTQ lawmakers have created the first LGBTQ caucus in the legislature there. This Saturday is uh, the latest edition of the Mobilizing Our Brothers initiative, an all-day conference for gay black men. Uh, it's going to be held at 213 East 121st Street, but you can get more information about it by going to the MOBI, Mobilizing Our Brothers Initiative, uh, dash nyc.com website. Uh, this is going to have uh, Black Lives Matters, uh, Matter uh, uh, activists, the former NFL player Wade Davis, uh, and Beyonce stylist Ty Hunter. It's quite a range of black gay men, and uh, it's a great effort. Now, this might not sound like something we would normally celebrate, but the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History has acquired an archival collection related to the work of John Smid, S-M-I-D, a former minister who ran conversion therapy stuff. Now, I think he's repented of all that, but we, but his archives yes. are important. Yes. I mean, what our enemies were doing all these years is also imp an important part of our history, and the Mattachine Society down there in Washington had a lot to do with making sure that this was acquired. Uh, and can we go to yes, international? Please, please. I, I think we have something about conversion therapy there. I'm looking for the segue. Oh, uh, at the in the United Kingdom, the Royal College of Psychiatrists has apologized for the trauma of conversion therapy that they have done periodically Not over the years. Not just that, the National Health Service is going to require doctors when they talk to adult patients to ask uh, what their sexual orientation is. You don't have to answer, uh, and some people are upset about this. But if we don't, if we don't, uh, if we're not counted, if we don't know who what we've got, we don't, you know. And it's a very important thing. For it's doctors all part to be of the process of normalization. Yes. It's we we want doctors to be comfortable asking. 
We want them to understand the issues around people's various sexual orientations and gender identities. Uh, and we want the patients to be able to be forthright about who they really are and what is really going on in their lives, just as we want routine HIV testing and everything else. We well, want a more open and honest world. As I said just a couple of weeks ago on the show, telling a story from the past, uh, I was asked when I was 18, when I went to a VD clinic by the doctor on Long Island, you're a homo, aren't you? <laughs> so that's not the way we want it asked. We want you to ask it neutrally and not pressure for an answer. Well, we'd like to suspect that the person asking the question is someone who is friendly. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and that suggests he was not. What if they have religious objections? Exactly. Uh, in Taiwan, we've been waiting for a decision from the high court about marriage, but they last week rejected the marriage request, the legalization request from a lesbian couple. They say that uh, parliament has not acted yet as they are required to do by a previous court decision. So uh, the two-year deadline for that is not up yet, so the high court was unwilling to uh, move on its own. And staying with marriage uh, in Austria, now it looks like the government there has moved to the right, but the constitutional court has accepted the argument that it's unconstitutional for children of same-sex couples to be deprived of having married parents. That's an, that's an interesting way to approach it, but it's kind of the way Kennedy approached it when he did the marriage decisions here in America. Yeah, that was part of it. but. Uh, uh, to me, what was important was they were extremely adamant and explicit about the fact that registered partnerships were not sufficient, that you must give people the word marriage, that uh, separate but equal is not an acceptable system. You have to uh, include us in. And in Costa Rica, November 8th through 11th, they're going to hold the first conference on equal civil marriage. And there will be people from all over the world there, including Evan Wolfson. Uh, and the sponsors include the embassies of the United States, Canada, and Switzerland. It's going to be a really big conference on international marriage uh, issues. Not if Tony Perkins gets wind of it. <laughs> he watches the show every week. Uh, and speaking of international marriage, uh, celebrity cruises, uh, cruise line ships uh, say claim that they are the first to offer worldwide same-sex marriage. Uh, most of their ships are registered in Malta, and because Malta now legalizes same-sex marriage, they can offer that on their ships. And who says you can't change? In Britain, a white supremacist, a famous one, uh, has, is renouncing his extremism, and he's coming out of the closet as a gay man with Jewish ancestry. <laughs> He said, you, you know, can't make this stuff up, folks. He said, you know, I realize that, you know, blaming, act blaming actions on the Jews as a group, well, that sh that's a kind of generalization that leads to six million people being deliberately murdered. <laughs> I mean, he, Wait, let me write that down. He, he admits that being a Nazi who is gay but with a Jewish background is a contradiction. Well, he's sorting it out. He is. The Council of Europe Parliament has adopted a resolution condemning unnecessary surgery on intersex people. Uh, they support bodily integrity. Uh, to, uh, the standard practice for eons has been to automatically do surgery yeah. on infants uh, to correct their bodies. What does the Catholic Church say about that? Uh, exactly. What does the Catholic Church say about that? Well, the UN uh, Human Rights Organization is condemning the arrest and tortures of gay people in, in Azerbaijan, Egypt, and Indonesia. And there's been more crackdown in Egypt, uh, where the local security forces this week raided cafes in downtown Cairo and are rounding up gay people. And in Tajikistan, a former Soviet uh, republic, they have constructed a list of the 367 gay people who live in Tajikistan. Out of 8.5 million people, this yeah. is how many there are, and they want to keep a list of them because, because they're so vulnerable to uh, STIs and things like that. And, and they might we spread have to keep disease, an eye on them. we and have to test them. Homosexuality is not illegal there. <laughs> yeah. uh, 
So the most stunning story, we've kind of buried the lead, comes from Russia, yes. uh, where Maxim Lapunov, we have, Lapunov a we have a picture of him, uh, Ch Chechen. Uh, uh, he's Russian, but he was living in Chechnya. Yes. Who the hell would move to Chechnya? But uh, all right, he did. Where he was dragged out of his home in the middle of the night and uh, taken... Well, to a secret hiding place. Well, taken uh, to a blood-soaked jail cell, uh, let out daily with a plastic bag over his head to be beaten by police officers and demand that he confess to being gay. And of course, the other thing they want out of you is, who are the other gays? Yeah, That's give the us thing. names. You gotta, you gotta give him names. And, uh, you know, he's just telling all in the hopes of, cause, because the government keeps saying, what are you talking about? It's not happening. Right. Uh, so we applaud Maxim for his courage. We hope he is safe. We hope he remains well, safe. And as many as 15 men uh, who were released by the police to their families haven't been heard from since. And they believe that some of them were uh, subject to honor killings. And of course, we've, as we've told you, some of them get out. They get out to Russia or they get out to Canada or wherever. And then they're hunted down by uh, foreign uh, national Chechens uh, to be beaten. Or they say, if you don't come back, we're going to we're going to start arresting your family. Yeah. They're just so obsessed with this. Yeah. Oh, horrifying. It is horrifying. And it's horrifying in Egypt. It's horrifying in Tajikistan. And I, I see this Tajikistan story, and I open up the New York Times today, and it's uh, the business section is about Tajikistan getting financing for their uh, uh, country from outside uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, investors. Uh, in Hong Kong, a gay man is suing the government because of the unequal criminalization of gay men. Okay. AIDS news. Yes. Uh, in uh, uh, there's trouble with a Puerto Rican HIV clinic. The space was flooded with sewage. Their materials and supplies were lost. Uh, it's just another example of the devastation of the hurricane in Puerto Rico. And as, uh, as you've pointed out, if you don't care about Puerto Ricans the way the president doesn't, you ought to at least care about the fact that they make many of our pharmaceuticals. It's yes. a place where they manufacture them, and they're having a great deal of difficulty with that. You may feel the shortage. Sad follow-up and, and longer explanation of the death of Michael Friedman, uh, New York theater director. He, at, he did Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson. Yes, he wrote he did. it. Yeah. He also produced the Encore series. Uh, Artistic uh, director of Encores and, and their production of Assassins, which we saw yeah. earlier this year. Dropped dead at 41, nine weeks after he was diagnosed with HIV. His friends had thought he was looking gaunt. You know, those, the, those the, spotches on your face, and, but they were afraid to say something in many cases. Yes. I and, mean. And they also thought, well. You have my permission, by the way, if you see anything on me, to say something. He went into the hospital and people thought, oh, well, you know, people don't die from that these days. He'll get the drugs. He'll be okay. Nine weeks later, dead. If it's gone too far, uh, that's what can happen. It, it can be uh, relentless. Yeah. Yes. So, Very sad. Very sad. So the, what's the lesson? Uh, you're, you're a sexually active adult. Uh, or using needles or whatever, get tested, uh, you know, regularly, and find out and get on the drugs as soon as you can. Well, when you if you test positive, and certainly if you are beginning to have symptoms, check it out. Don't wait till the last minute. Right. All right. Uh, segue from AIDS news to entertainment. From news. waiting to the last minute to beats per minute. Yeah. This is the French film by Robin Campillo. Is that how we say his name? And he was an Act Up Paris veteran. There's a, there's a still from the film. Um, he, he's the guy who also directed Eastern Boys, which we had a high oh, opinion, I like that, yeah. opinion of. Uh, uh, the, the still you saw was from an, uh, an action at a pharmaceutical company where they were, you know, putting fake blood on the walls and putting up signs saying assassin. Right. And I, I thought those were really the most uh, effective scenes. They also have a lot of scenes at the Paris Act Up meetings. I mean, it takes you right inside them. And then, of course, there's romances that take place and, of course, death and dying issues that it, that it covers. I, I wasn't crazy about the film, but I, I'm too close to it. Yeah. I was too involved one with of, Act Up New York. You were one of the leaders of Act Up. Well, I'd like to say there were no leaders, but... Um, um, but I was certainly heavily involved. Now, I never attended an ACT UP Paris meeting, so I can't 
talk about how accurate the film was in portraying that. To me, the scenes in the film of the meeting were a little too humorless, a little too process-oriented, a little too small. But I don't know. Maybe that's what those meetings were like. Right, but because, it didn't in, because in New York, you, were, you had 500 people a week in, uh, down at yes, the um, uh, Cooper Union. Yes, um, starting with a couple hundred at the community center and then growing and growing and growing and eventually moving to Cooper Union. But uh, And there was a lot more energy and a lot more... Uh, uh, well, you discussion said, you said and anger. humor also. Amazing humor at the ACT UP meetings and flirtations and, and none of that was at the meetings in this film. I liked the romantic parts of the film. I thought the sexiness of it was representative and good, but it all seemed a little small to me, but my experience was of something that was very big. So, uh, and this was a big award winner at the Cannes Film Festival. Grand Jury and, Prize, which yeah. is the second prize. And people like it, so It opens I don't... October 20th in New York at the Angelica and at the Film Society of Lincoln Center before a national rollout. BPM beats per minute. And I also saw, uh, moving to entertainment news, uh, Lonely Planet, an AIDS-themed play. Mm. Uh, this is by uh, Stephen Dietz, and it, it was from 25 years ago. And I went to it because Arnie uh, Burton was one of the stars, two guys in it working in a, a maps store, kind of one of them paralyzed by the AIDS crisis mm -hmm. and not wanting to go out and not wanting to face it and all that kind of stuff. And I just sadly felt that it was kind of inert as a play. I thought I would be, I think it probably worked a lot better 25 years ago. Well, if you want to see a whole panoply of LGBT and AIDS films this weekend, the New York City New Fest uh, Film Festival is on. They have 140 different films uh, from the 19th to the 24th. And it's, an, I, I tell you some of the highlights, but there's so many. Uh, I can't possibly go through them in less than the full hour of the show. So go to newfest.org to pick and choose uh, among the ones you want to see. There are a lot of interesting films. And here's something you can see if you get BBC America, if you have it on demand on your television. Uh, BBC America ran this series called Queers, these 20-minute monologues. Fantastically written, at least the one by uh, Alan Cumming as a guy who's about to get married. They all take place in a bar, and they're all monologues. Uh, uh, ben Wishaw plays a World War One soldier, uh, um, and then uh, Russell Tovey plays an actor in 1987 who keeps getting AIDS roles, and a woman named Rebecca Front plays the wife of a gay man in the 50s. So brilliantly written, so funny, so moving. I was in tears over the Alan Cumming one and laughed a lot. So that's running through 1110 on your television set uh, through November the 10th uh, on demand. Take, check them out. And Chris Cooper recommends Star Trek Discovery, the new Star Trek TV series. Episode 5 reveals that Anthony Rapp and Wilson Cruz are a same-sex couple. In space. Yeah. And on uh, and from the ridiculous to the more ridiculous, on the Young and the Restless, they're developing a lesbian storyline between two young adult women in their twenties, and they're sort of circling each other. They've had a kiss, and they at first one wants to talk about it, and the other one doesn't, and then that one wants to talk about it, and the other one doesn't. So they're they're working through this very slowly. And I wish I could recommend uh, the revival of Time and the Conways, because I like J.B. Priestley, who wrote it, uh, and I like Elizabeth McGovern from uh, Downton Abbey. Mm -hmm. But it's really uh, uh, family ugliness is what it's about, That's about an upper-middle-class family, and it's sort of like the kind of thing you want to avoid at Thanksgiving. Well, maybe less ugly will be the third and final volume of Quentin Crisp's autobiography <laughs> coming out on November 21st, The Last Word. Yes, well, he's been dead for 18 years, so... Really? Yes. I remember having dinner with him. <laughs> That's it. Goodbye.